Welcome, everybody. So glad that everybody could join us tonight. And um, tonight's going to be quite full. We're going to go over a wide variety of topics relating to dermatology. If at any time you have questions, please type those in the chat and we will answer those as quickly as we can. Scarlett is our Director of uh, Marketing and Education and she joins us tonight as well. So she will be uh, jumping in and uh, making sure that all your questions get answered. Um, certainly if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out. We can definitely help you um, when we're at the pharmacy as well. So let's get started. So a little bit of background about me. Um, we will be talking about a medication called low-dose naltrexone. It is off-label use. So I just want to let everybody know that toward the end, uh, we will be chatting about that. So skin issues are very significant. They affect literally every type of skin, every age. Doesn't matter if you're a male or female. Um, but throughout our life, sometimes dermatology issues change. Things that we have earlier in life may not show up until, uh, may actually subside, and then other issues may actually crop up later. Some issues tend to be a little bit more um, specific to whether it's um, uh, an issue due to sunlight or lack of nutrients. Sometimes it has to do with things that are going on in our gut as well. And that's a really big thing. We have to always address what is going on in the gut. Often we see a variety of issues like rosacea, uh, whether or not we're talking about eczema, psoriasis, that can all be due to something that's underlying and growing in the gut. I apologize for this guy back here. That's Bauer and he's a baby and very curious. So tonight we're gonna to get started with hair loss and alopecia. Hair loss is something that affects men and women um, almost equally. Sometimes it is due to a hormone imbalance, can be autoimmune, can be, definitely be inflammatory, can also be due to genetics. There are some specific genetic testing that can be done to identify some of those markers that perhaps we can change or at least influence and then either change the pattern of hair loss, slow it down, or even stop it. Uh, this is a test called Trico test that is, uh, has to be ordered by a physician. The physician, the results go back to the physician as well, although pharmacies can help with that process. It does go over not only 13 different genes, but 48 genetic variations associated with alopecia. And that has proven to be very beneficial so that as people um, perhaps see um, just alopecia areata, maybe it doesn't necessarily move into alopecia totalis or universalis. In other words, perhaps it stays localized and isn't necessarily covering their entire body. Um, the genetic analysis is reproducible approximately almost 100% of the time. The beauty of it, it's a one-time thing. You don't necessarily have to repeat it because it is a genetic uh, DNA microassay. It analyzes prostaglandin metabolism, the difference of inflammation and androgenic effects, what's going on with blood flow to the bulb or where the hair actually starts, what's going on with collagen, vitamin and mineral metabolism, as well as insulin-like growth factor. That's really important because if there's a lot of inflammation in the body, if someone has um, diabetes, prediabetes or a metabolic syndrome, that can all affect hair issues, including alopecia. So that hair growth can be changed once we're able to identify exactly what's going on. We can use very specific medications, most of which are topical and most of which don't have very many side effects. Whether or not, um, they're inexpensive, really has to do with the very specific medication. The beauty of compounding is that we're able to put some of these together and decrease the costs. Factors that promote alopecia, um, elevated testosterone levels, um, hormone changes, inflammation, of course, a loss or lack of blood circulation, 
And that can be due to a wide variety of disease states as well, including high blood pressure, a lack or low levels of very specific vitamins and nutrients, of course, stress. And we've known a little bit about stress the last year. Of course, there's environmental issues and many other host issues, specifically autoimmune. This was a, an abstract that was written. Uh, it's a peer reviewed paper that was developed by a very good friend of mine, Patel, uh, Gopesh Patel. He owns a pharmacy in, actually two pharmacies back in New York. And this solution of uh, the mixture of minoxidil with finasteride not only decreases the inflammation, but also the change in how testosterone is utilized in the body and enhances hair growth. There was another product that was used that you, uh, Lentanoprost is a medication we use for glaucoma. It's actually an eye drop. And with that, we mix it with uh, minoxidil and it can be applied specifically to the scalp or wherever you want hair to grow back. And we see uh, hair growth very quickly. So this is um, yet another formula that was used specifically for a young female. Again, this is a 42 year old female. And within 30 days, you can actually see fine hair growth. And within two years, you, you don't see where she had issues to begin with, which some people think, oh my gosh, I have to wait two years. But two years is actually a really good time frame because it takes about nine months for a hair to grow um, quite steadily and also to a length that we would really notice. Our hair grows about a quarter of an inch or so every 30 days, sometimes a little bit more, but when we're dealing with stress and having to regrow at the hair bulb, that can take a little bit of time. Gopesh was very kind to share these slides. Specifically, this is a 24 year old male. Again, a very young individual. You can see quite a bit of hair growth there. And this is only after three months. So this formula included a little bit of a vitamin as well as the minoxidil finasteride to slow down the conversion of testosterone and along with a little bit of caffeine citrate. Again, this is applied just twice a day and we see dramatic results. This is a 34 year old woman who was uh, losing some hair because she had just had a baby. So again, a lot of hormone changes there. With that, she saw quite a significant area of hair loss. And within just three months, we saw a significant increase in hair. Um, this again is a slide photo um, courtesy of uh, Dr. Rosnack, and she practices in New York. She literally is um, one of the doctors to quite a few um, very famous people. So you might be looking at the tops of some very famous people's heads. This is a 51 year old male. Again, a really nice combination of products and only applied twice a day. And you can significantly see the changes in hair growth even after 90 days. So hyperpigmentation, that's where you see a lot of condensing of, of coloring in the skin. And this is really very concerning for some people. It can be most noticeable in areas where we have skin exposed to quite a bit of sunlight. So usually on the arms, but on the neck, the decloe, as well as the face, and sometimes on the top of the head as well. Melasma is one of the conditions, uh, diagnoses that is often given to women, uh, but melasma can affect men as well. There is a hormone imbalance behind that. And with the use of hydroquinone, it's a very um, old medication that we've used to help decrease pigmentation, but there's a wide variety of other products that we can use as well. And we listed quite a few um, uh, very specific formulas that we have uh, seen some proven results with. Chemical peels are one of those um, wonderful easy to apply products, but again, this is not something you're gonna do at home. You're gonna use this under the very direct care of a well-known physician. So a physician who is very well studied in aesthetics. 
there's a wide variety of commercially available peels. We do make several that can be um, changed in the formula so that there's less irritation. Some of these literally just vitalize or, or brighten the skin and they can be used as often as every, um, every month or every two months. And sometimes if we use the same peel over and over every two weeks, we see uh, better results with the skin, whether it's diminishing fine lines, diminishing pigmentation, we can even see changes in pore size. Again, these are peels that are used specifically at the doctor's offices. These are not things that are dispensed for you to take home and use. And um, we do see these dispensed. Um, we make them in, this, in our store with a prescription and then they are delivered to the doctor's office so that they can um, be applied there. This one I, I see quite a bit because as we go through this summer, we're exposed to quite a bit of sun and sometimes we're exposed to just a tiny bit too much sun and our skin looks really dry and rough. With that, we can use some peels to actually take down a layer or two and brighten the skin and decrease the sun damage. We also see that this works incredibly well for um, condensed areas of pigment and acne issues. And condensed areas of pigment, maybe there's a little bit um, like the kind of a brown spot behind the ears, that can be due to a thyroid change. So here again, courtesy of Dr. Patel, is uh, this is a Jesner peel in a 47 year old woman. Um, we added a little bit of other medications to decrease inflammation as well as get to some of the deeper layers of the skin. So we're not going super deep, but we are going about two or three layers down. Now, if she were to run outside and expose herself to the sun, she would actually become pretty red and very irritated. But again, this is only 60 days later. This is a very dramatic change in her skin. So let's talk a little bit about bruising. Um, I love this formula. We use heparin, so heparin is a blood thinner. Uh, it's usually used as an injectable. We can use it in a topical cream. And this is only uh, changes within three days. So the 64 year old woman fell and slipped and uh, she hit herself. She had a nasty hematoma. She had some uh, blood loss underneath the skin. And again, just twice a day for three days, you see some dramatic results. This is a 69 year old woman who um, did have a, an injury and she fell and kind of tumbled a little bit. This was applied three times a day. And again, after three days, you see a dramatic change in the pigmentation. Vitiligo is one of those issues that affects people of all ethnicity. It's not just necessarily noticeable on individuals who have darker skin or more melanin in their skin. But this is a 64 year old male. This is a medication that is uh, generally super expensive. It is commercially available in an injectable form. We have been able to source the, um, the base product, the raw product and put it into a very nice cream. And this is applied and you can see uh, in this individual, not only are some of his spots completely gone but you never really knew where they were. And this is a lighter skinned woman. Um, if you look around, right around her mouth, she has kind of these round circles and you can also see on her chest and even above her brow that she has some very light areas that look to have absolutely no pigment whatsoever. And again, she applied this just twice a day and you can see a dramatic change in with, within two weeks, but even just a month later, even more dramatic changes. This woman was, able to uh, resume her marketing job, which I thought was just lovely. So whenever we're dealing specifically with skin lightening preparations, we're able to manipulate and add more than one product in the same cream. And that can be much more economical, but it can also be a way to kind of tackle more than one issue at any given time. And I do apologize, there's a lot of information on these slides and we're gonna go through them fairly quickly. Nobody's expected to um, memorize this whatsoever. This is just um, some science behind what we do. 
And here's a few more ingredients that we use. And I included their uh, types of activity because that will also help us to understand why we would combine one or the other. Now you'll notice that some of these medications might sound a little bit familiar. So methimazole is actually a medication that we use if somebody's thyroid is acting up and is working too well. So a hyperthyroid issue, we use this in animals, we use this in humans, but we can use it topically as well, specifically to help lighten the skin. However, in this situation, we wanna make sure that that person's thyroid is functioning optimally because we don't want to reduce their function too far. Same thing with metformin. Metformin we know does help to decrease the pigment in the skin because it blocks a very specific um, uh, hormone that produces melanin in the skin. This is a 30% cream. We do use this in a topical formation. Uh, that formulation helps to reduce blood sugar levels as well. So again, if somebody is running low on their blood sugars, we wanna make sure that they are um, checked for that before we start using this. But again, we don't see the side effects that we normally see with oral medications. So when somebody's skin is um, too dark and they want to be a lighter skin, sometimes that has to do with whether it's a historical issue due to different cultural differences or even um, well, we saw Michael Jackson go through this, right? Where it just seems to have worked with some uh, areas of the world where they just want their skin to be lighter or to be fair. Um, and that, that skin change goes back centuries. Uh, we saw this even back in Asian cultures where people would actually put on white makeup because they wanted to have lighter colored skin. We see this, um, this is a, a true picture of kind of a before and after it is um, melded together, but you can see where her skin was very splotchy and had a lot of uh, deep and condensed areas of melanin. And we were able to use medications to help decrease that so that uh, her face could be kind of a blended all one shade. So the area on the left is not with makeup. Or you can always use mechanical filters, right? Poor Yoda. He still looks better on the left. So historically, we saw some uh, changes in perception, some cultural issues, and uh, that is something that transcends every country and every part of the world. Hydroquinone is a medication that is traditionally been used on a regular basis. Um, for a while, it was available over the counter. Um, Esoterica was a medication cream uh, that was available. Gosh, I want to say it was in kind of a pink box. It had a 4% hydroquinone in it, and women used it back in the 70s and, and earlier to help decrease the um, spotchiness or even freckles on their skin. It can be very irritating and it has to be kept in a very specific kind of jar. Hydroquinone does not like metal whatsoever and it can literally change its, um, its structure and break it down. And it turns brown very quickly. But tranexamic acid is a product that we use to help decrease bleeding as well. Um, so when the dentist pulls teeth and they want, and somebody's on blood thinners, then we're able to use it topically that way. But we also know that it's a plasma inhibitor. So it will decrease the amount of um, melanocyte production. So we can tackle this pretty early on in that change phase. We can use tranexamic acid as a solution and we can use it part of the peel process as well. Oh, and it can also be used orally, which is really interesting. Niacinamide is a B vitamin. It's one that we use quite a bit for a wide variety of issues. A lot of times we're using it in acne preparations, but with this, it will actually change the irregular appearance of pigmentation. So if there is an area that is got a kind of a ruffly edge, it can smooth that out. It also helps to decrease the, um, the acceptance of some of the 
sunscreens, the ones that start with an O, they are actually starting to see some association with changes in the skin and, and actually skin cancer production. And we're able to use very natural products to slow that process down. Same thing with ascorbic acid, vitamin C. So this doesn't mean that you run out and you grab your vitamin C and you start you know, rubbing it on your face. What we do know is that it works on very specific areas to again, decrease melanocytes. So melanocytes are those, those uh, parts of the cell that actually carry the pigment, carry the brown color. So let's move on to acne. Um, before I, are there any questions so far? No? Okay, let's move right into acne. This is a really big topic and I only have one picture um, mainly because it's, um, it's so variable. We could literally spend an entire evening just talking about acne. But what I wanna touch on here is that uh, it's not something that affects just teenage people. It does affect people of all ages. And there tends to be a, a rise in acne when people are um, reaching hormonal changes. So specifically women between 30 and 55, there tends to be some changes. But anytime we see hormonal changes where uh, testosterone is collecting as a metabolite in the skin, we see cystic acne. So not necessarily little pustules, um, but definitely the accumulation of uh, blackheads and specifically areas that really don't have anything in them, but they throb and they're raised and they can be um, rather painful. So here we've combined uh, four different medications to go after different areas of the, uh, where acne is produced. I will also say here that Right off the bat, we usually use a really good well-rounded probiotic because when we can change what's going on in the gut, we can often see a change and a betterment in skin appearance, especially acne. These are a couple of brand name products. Uh, some of them have generics, but I wanted to also touch on these because they do contain products that a lot of people go, ooh. So like, you know, um, sometimes parabens really bother people. Um, BHT, which is butylated hydroxytoluene. Sometimes, and that's a preservative, that's an antioxidant so that something doesn't turn kind of yellow or brown. But these two products are rather expensive. And yet when we make something that's clindamycin with some tretinoin, and tretinoin is a vitamin A derivative, you're not gonna see these prices at, at my pharmacy anyway. I can't really speak for other pharmacies, but you wouldn't see that kind of price. And a lot of times when doctors write prescriptions, they don't really understand how expensive it is because everybody's insurance is really different. But yet when you get to the pharmacy counter and you're like, oh my gosh, even $238 for the generic is super expensive. I don't know too many people that can really afford that. So when we're dealing with medications that we know are affecting not just a, let's say an adolescent skin or an adult skin, it's not just a skin perception, right? It's also how it affects your mood, how it affects your confidence and your feeling of self-worth. You don't, people tend to stare and we don't like that, but we do see here a very good alternative to that. And we can use this in a wide variety of bases. This is just one base, but again, it's nowhere near $240. That's, that's outrageous. That's a lot of money. But dermatology preps tend to be very expensive. So here's one that's a little bit of uh, tretinoin to again help to uh, with cell turnover so you can get rid of the, the um, damaged skin quicker. There's an antibiotic. There's a second antibiotic with the clindamycin and sulfacetamide. And clarifying base is a very specific base that we know helps with um, acne skin. WO6 is a base to help drive these medications deeper into the skin layers where the oil glands are sitting. And then we also make a, a product, it's a, a pad. So we put the solution on these pads and I'm sure a lot of people remember Stridex. So that's kind of what they look like 
But again, it's um, sulfacetamide, which is one antibiotic, clindamycin is another, and then salicylic acid, which helps with um, cell turnover. And that 50 pads, I think, is less than $50. So again, very affordable. Let's move into eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, and seborrhea. Again, we could do an entire talk on these, on these different subjects, and, and I have, but tonight we're just gonna do a brief overview. And of course, if you have questions, let me know. Psoriasis is one of those things that uh, affects people of all ages, it tends to affect men and women almost equally, but can be very unsightly, usually, you will see plaques like this around the elbow, on the back of the arm, um, in the webbing of the hands, sometimes behind the neck and in the ears, but also on the trunk of the body or where clothing sits pretty closely. Psoriasis is a raised, red raised plaque. The whitish area here is the skin that is older and those cells are sloughing off. It can be painful, it can be hot, it can be itchy. Uh, some people, when they take their shirt off, there's dandruff or what looks like dandruff just falling off all over everywhere. Sometimes psoriasis can also be a connected part to arthritis. There is an autoimmune component to psoriasis, but there is directly a link between what is growing in the gut. We actually have gut tests that can identify what pathogens are in the gut. So is there too much yeast and fungus? Are there some bad bacterias? What about virus? What about protozoa? Or even some types of little bugs. And when we can identify those, we can get rid of them. It might take anywhere from three to six months, but we can help get rid of it. And when we see that, we immediately see a reduction in the inflammation and the presentation of these issues within um, 30 to 60 days. This is a topical product. Um, it does contain a couple of older medications, but again, just because they're older doesn't mean that they're bad. A lot of times the older stuff works just as well. And this is a 21, or excuse me, a 20 year old female. She was at college and found that stress was a huge trigger for her psoriasis. Usually psoriasis is better in the sun time, in the summertime because of the sun. Anytime that we can increase your blood level of vitamin D, that also helps enhance the presentation of psoriasis so that it looks better. It tends to decrease. Here's eczema in a 25 year old. Um, she had been dealing with eczema pretty much on and off her entire life. And within two days, let alone three days, we see a tremendous change. This was in a topical cream. Cyanocobalamin is a, a B12 derivative and a little bit of zinc and a little mild steroid to help decrease the inflammation. So again, twice a day, wonderful results. And she looked phenomenal a little bit um, down the road. So within a month, she had very little left. Eczema can be raised, it can be itchy, it can be, it can, your skin can be really dry and it can catch on your clothing. But the other part of it, again, it's sometimes about what's growing in your gut. So rosacea, we are finding that is a very good possibility that rosacea is actually due to a mite that is burrowed into the skin. But we also see some very specific bad players in the gut. H. pylori, there's a very specific form of chlamydia that can be identified in the gut. It causes an irritation in the skin, usually um, areas in the, in the face and around the eyes. With, uh, when we use some topical steroids, it tends to get better, but not in everybody. Sometimes if we use steroids for too long of a period of time, it actually rebounds and comes back worse. Here's a couple of dramatic pictures about rosacea, two different types. So the one on the bottom actually has um, uh, the papulopustular. So there's raised bumps and they have um, sometimes some goo in those bumps. They actually look like pimples. But a lot of times rosacea looks like somebody was scalded or burned. It's actually the blood vessels are coming closer to the, the upper layers of the skin. Metronidazole is a very typical 
medication that is prescribed often for rosacea. It is rather expensive when it is available just across the regular pharmacy counter. We tend to throw a little bit of niacinamide in with the metronidazole. We use a very specific cream and we can see changes within 30 to 60 days. Oxymetazoline is also an anti, um, anti decongestant. So it's, it's in eye drops to help clear out that redness in your eye, but we can um, often prescribe a product called Rofade. It is brand only, incredibly expensive. And again, um, by the way, these are pharmacy costs. That's actually what it costs a pharmacy to bring that in. That isn't what your price would be. That's, that'd be my cost. Some people don't do well with lanolin or coconut oil. So these types of ingredients in the cream uh, don't necessarily work well for everybody. It does have to be evenly applied and we need to avoid direct contact to the eyes and the lips and don't put it on open wounds because uh, not a good idea. It really irritates and causes um, a lot of fluid to build up. But we can use oxymetazoline topically. We can throw in a little bit of ketotiphen, which is a wonderful decongestant as well, decreases irritation and redness. So we're going after it with two different medications here. And again, not horribly expensive. Oral antibiotics tend to really help a wide variety of skin or inflamed skin issues because doxycycline is a well, well known, very broad spectrum antibiotic, but it actually has other types of uh, activity. So we know that doxycycline works specifically on some, some bad players. These are organisms that invade the mouth and the gut. They tend to irritate the stomach lining and the gut lining, which can then allow food particles, other metabolites, other even good bacteria to leave and then eventually leave the stomach, go through the bloodstream and land on the skin. However, not everybody can handle taking oral doxycycline. It can be really hard on the gut. So we can change the volume or the strength. We can even add other elements to enhance the activity of the medication, but also um, decrease its um, the way it sits in your gut. And I, and some people describe it as kind of a lower gut issue, kind of around your low abdomen, like things are cramping and it just is not, doesn't feel good at all. But what it also does is it wipes out the really good players, the really good bacteria, the good guys in your gut. So we do need to replace that and we can use good probiotics for that. The reason why we throw zinc in there is because it has very specific skin healing properties. And this is a couple of uh, journal articles. One is a lot newer than the other, but again, the, we know so much about what happens in the skin that there's really no reason not to compound something that is going to really work. A lot of times when we're dealing with skin issues, it's not uncommon that somebody is you know, they're, they're given a prescription, they go back to the dermatologist or the, to their doctor a month or two later, this didn't work. So they're given another prescription. It almost feels like a dart at the dartboard kind of thing, but it doesn't have to be. So sometimes we can, we can prescribe things in smaller quantities, use it for two to four weeks, and then um, in a, certainly a lot less cost. Azalic acid not only helps to decrease inflammation in the skin, but we it's very easily combined with other medication to decrease the redness, the inflammation, um, the itching, and we can select a very specific base so that again, we can nourish the skin while we're trying to decrease some of these issues. So Retin-A or Tretinoin has been around for a very long period of time. And when the medication went off patent, the manufacturer decided that they were going to make these polymeric porous microspheres. Not really sure how that makes the medication any better, but it sure made it a lot bigger price. 
but we use tretinoin in Pracosil, and Pracosil is one of my favorite bases to use because it's very soothing. It uh, has quite a few ceramides in it, so it helps, again, build the structure of the skin underneath as it heals. It helps heal the skin, and it's only applied three days a week. And the reason is, is because tretinoin can cause a lot of redness in the skin, and it can, uh, sometimes it looks worse before it gets better. But we can change that, we can lower the strength, we can change the base, and we can also incorporate other medications that again are going to go after the primary issues, but also uh, enhance the activity of the tretinoin. So seborrheic dermatitis is caused by a wide variety of issues there really doesn't seem to be one, one area. And it affects people in uh, younger ages as well as teenagers, as well as middle age and older people. So there really isn't um, one age range that it kind of picks on. It doesn't really matter um, what your genetic background are. However, if you are living in a cold, dry climate, this tends to be more of an issue. Not so much around here, a little bit, but not so much, right? I mean, it gets cold, but we are, we're damp most of the year. Our humidity today was still 60 in the 60 percentile. It's crazy. Um, it's not necessarily caused by poor hygiene. It's not that you're not washing. It's not that you're using really abrasive soaps and it's definitely not an, an allergy. It doesn't really seem to harm the skin. It just looks unsightly, which to me is just as, just as much of an issue as anything else. So what we usually do is use medications to help turn that skin over a little bit faster. We could definitely use some antifungal products and some zinc. I love zinc pyrethrone because it um, nourishes the skin. It works on those little bit deeper layers. Zinc is very necessary in helping rebuild the structure of those skin cells. We can use a little bit of topical steroid but again, we can combine all of those and really make for a very nice product. And again, without those whopping prices. This is a commercially available ketoconazole. Ketoconazole is a um, antifungal. Some people use it for their athlete's foot. Um, it works very, very well. There is no generic for this product. So we're not allowed to compound something that matches or re reproduces identically what is commercially available. However, we have so many different bases. We can change up the strength. We can change up, um, maybe you're allergic to some uh, ingredient in the base, or maybe you're allergic to the colorants. We don't have to add those. We can use products to um, enhance its activity. And so therefore we can get around um, what looks like a, a copy. It's pretty easy to do. Um, again, six hundred dollars for forty-five gram. That's only one and a half ounce. That's like what comes. That's about the size of your toothpaste tube. If you're only using it for a couple of weeks, I think we could do a little bit better for you. These are again a couple of um, alternative formulas. Anytime we're using tacrolimus. That again affects how the cells turn over. We can actually cause them to turn over a little bit faster. Here's a little bit of zinc, maybe some steroid. Maybe we can uh, throw a little bit of antifungal in there as well. And these are a couple of studies that again, they're not very old, but they, those, these studies look specifically at very key ingredients. So we know that they work. We have the science behind it, but it again um, works incredibly well. And there's just one more. So let's talk a little bit about herpes simplex infection. So these can be cold sores. Um, they're also called fever blisters. Um, shingles kind of tends to fall into that category as well. And there really aren't too many topicals available to address the actual infection. So acyclovir is an antiviral. It is quite commonly prescribed. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, the price of the medication has gone up significantly to the point where some physicians are no longer prescribing because it's so expensive, nobody's gonna buy it anyway. However, we can make a really nice elegant cream that is absorbed 
and it's going to help decrease the the intensity of the virus and shorten the duration of the virus. And we can put a little bit of lidocaine in there to also soothe and help decrease the tingling and the burning and even the pain associated with that. If this is a, a shingle, which obviously this picture is specific to um, uh, the cold sores, if we're dealing with a shingles that is even like around the hairline or there's some neuralgia or nerve pain associated with, with that shingle infection, maybe the lesions are completely gone, but what has stayed behind is kind of this funny nerve pain. Sometimes even just moving the hair a little bit in the wind can set that off. And this can happen anywhere on your body. It's not necessarily just here or in your uh, anywhere on your face. We can make a spray that can help that as well. So we can enhance its absorption and decrease its um, uh, duration of, of effect. All right, questions yet? I'm sorry, this is a huge topic. We could literally be here for days. Atopic dermatitis and actinic keratosis. Atopic dermatitis is a huge category. Really doesn't affect one specific issue, but we use a wide variety of medications for this. Atopic dermatitis could be uh, could affect very young children, can affect people of all ages. Sometimes this is a diagnosis that's given when we're not really sure what else to do. Um, so it can be a little bit of a catch-all, but there are some very specific medications that we can use. A lot of times we'll use some topical steroids to help decrease the itching, decrease the redness. Um, we can use some antibiotics and some anti, uh, antiseptics to help decrease any type of uh, bacterial or fungal growth. And a lot of times we'll use some topical antihistamine to decrease the kind of the itching. Sometimes with topicals, we do see some side effects. Sometimes the medications are absorbed and then get into the rest of the body and then can um, make you sleepy or uh, give you a dry mouth, constipation, things like that. So Eladil has been around for a little bit of a little while. It is available generically, but it still packs a pretty wallop on the, the pocketbook. Sometimes insurance covers it, sometimes it doesn't. But again, we can use medications in similar format to go after that. So protoptic is tacrolimus. It is, that's a bulk ingredient that we use quite often. We use it for a wide variety of issues and uh, it does not pack this whopping price tag. When we use tacrolimus, we don't always put it in an ointment. It can be put in a gel. It can also be put in um, a very soothing base like Pracasil that we can build up the ceramides at the same time. So we're actually um, helping to build those, those skin layers and soothe them, help them to feel uh, more normal. Because a lot of times when we're dealing with atopic dermatitis, the area can be quite large. It's not necessarily just a small area. and It may not be localized to one part of the body. It could literally attack different areas of the body at the same time. Azelastine is a nasal spray, but we, we use that in conjunction with tacrolimus to decrease the um, itching and the irritability of the skin, decrease the redness and uh, help it heal at the same time. Scarlett? We do have a question in the chat that just came in. Have you ever heard of pemphigus? This is what I've been diagnosed with. It's autoimmune and there's no cure. Blisters on my face that won't heal. Yeah, so pemphigoid is one of those um, autoimmune issues that we, um, we do see from time to time. And we use oral low-dose naltrexone quite effectively. I don't have pictures of, of uh, this skin issue, but it can be quite painful. And the reason why we use oral naltrexone, low dose naltrexone is because it will work at the cellular level, both on the receptors inside the cell and also on top of the, on top of the cell. 
and in the skin so that it can decrease the irritation, decrease that collection of fluid that makes those blisters, decrease the discoloration. So a lot of times it can be um, anywhere from pink to purple to brown. We see that decrease with a little bit of time. So oral low-dose naltrexone will, will work directly on those receptors. Works incredibly well. Um, it's low dose naltrexone is is a prescription product, doesn't really have a lot of side effects, and we can uh, we will talk a little bit more about that as we go through. But it is something you slowly increase your dose with. Um, if you want to talk more about that, we actually have um, I believe there's a couple of studies that I can dig up for you that um, addresses that. Atopic dermatitis. This is what. Um, uh, a resting cell looks like and one that is activated, you know, it's deflated, it's kind of diffused and it's broken up a little bit. It's, it's very different in shape and we want it to be nice and plump so that it, it um, uh, doesn't necessarily invade certain receptors. So we can use a little bit of B12. We can use a medication to help go after that mast cell specifically and then also decrease the irritation, the redness and the itching. So Dermasmooth is a medication that is commonly prescribed, but it contains alcohol and peanut oil. Now, most of my family is allergic to peanuts as well as a wide variety of other tree nuts. And most of the time when these prescriptions are written, these little ingredients are not known so we really don't know until it's a little bit too late. So in other words, somebody's got a skin irritation, they have atopic derm, what you see here. And obviously there's been a lot of scratching, a lot of irritation going on. Um, however, when you apply alcohol, that's gonna dry the skin even more, perhaps even thin the layers and cause even more itching and irritation. But if somebody is allergic to peanuts, then we have a bigger issue to deal with. So we can avoid all of this by using these simple ingredients, using really nice bases that um, Zematop is one of my favorites because it, care, it, it not only has very specific ingredients to rebuild those skin layers, not necessarily on top, but the granular layer, which is kind of the layer in the middle, but also the ones at the bottom. Because when you're itching this deeply, you're, you're breaking the skin. So we want to be able to reconnect that fibrin and collagen without scarring. So actinic keratosis is, uh, a, sorry, Scarlett, go ahead. Sorry, I wasn't quick enough. So we have another question. Um, molluscus contagiosis. There's some confusion about the spelling and definitely I'm not pronouncing it right. <laughs> So molluscum contagiosa is uh, a skin issue. It can be viral and or autoimmune. And we do use a wide variety of uh, medications topically to address that very effectively. So molluscum can affect usually younger children, uh, maybe even adolescents, but it is something that we can affect not only the coloration of the skin, but can also leave behind little bumps. Sometimes it's in kind of the armpit or down the trunk, but it's not necessarily localized just to that area. We use um, sometimes mild steroids, but there are very specific medications that we have seen very good success with. There are a couple of pres uh, non-prescription products that you could pick up at a regular drugstore. And I apologize, it starts with a Z and um, the actual name of it just went whoop right out of my head. But molluscum is, um, I don't want to say it's self-limiting because sometimes it sticks around for months and is very difficult. It's just irritating. It's just one of those things that just kind of pops up out of nowhere. And it's like, where the heck did this come from? But um, it is easily treatable. So I don't want anybody to feel that they, they don't have options because there are options. They may not necessarily be something that is... Um, uh, you know, by big pharma that a drug rep is going to come around and give a great big spiel on it, but it also doesn't break up a great big price tag. So when you go see your physician, let them know that you've heard about some compounded 
options and have them give us a call. We're happy to walk through what those options are. We do this every single day. So actinic keratosis is literally um, raised areas. Sometimes they're just discolored, but usually they're a scaly area where there's been a lot of sun damage. This can happen on bald heads. It can actually happen on heads that still have hair, but maybe thinning hair. But usually you're gonna see that on the left arm if somebody drives all the time or on their right arm if they are a passenger quite a bit because that that window on the side of the car tends to magnify some of the rays and change that. Actinic keratosis can be red, it can be brown, um, and they are a lot of times a precancerous lesion. They can be changed and they can be treated quite well. Sometimes it's a basal cell carcinoma, carcinoma but sometimes they can actually become a squamous cell. Those areas can be precancerous and they're easy to treat early on. When they are starting to kind of move into the uh, more into the cancerous area, usually they have to go in and, and scrape and then or melt down the skin or then actually do a deeper procedure like a Mohs procedure where they actually take a chunk out. Um, but we can treat these pretty early on. This is the top of a, a gentleman's head, and he was prescribed uh, fluouracil, which, which is a chemotherapeutic product. Uh, it's also called Effudex or Carac. It's available in a cream. It's also available in a solution. Solutions can be kind of hard to control. In other words, these medications are applied directly to the areas that are affected. So you wouldn't necessarily just spread it all over thinking you're going to then take care of everything on that surface. You actually wanna control exactly where it goes. And the solutions are a little bit more difficult because they run. Um, they're really thin. Um, they're about as thin as uh, glycerin. Um, so they're not as thin as water. They're a little bit thicker than water, but they still go everywhere. Amiquamod is another commercially available product that tends to go after the virus or the cell turnover that is underneath. And sometimes we use diclofenac, which Voltaren just went over the counter. We use it a lot for inflammation and pain. Uh, but it, when we are using it for this specific use, we are using it in much higher strengths than what is commercially available, especially the over-the-counter product. So these are a few different uh, types. These are different stages. And it just kind of shows you the progression. So of course, moving left to right, um, lower grade, middle grade, upper grade, or grade one, two, or three. And certainly by the time it gets to kind of this raised plaque area, that can catch on clothing, um, on a comb, on a brush, and can peel the skin back, can be a little bit painful, and can bleed. And this just shows very significant sun damage. You can avoid most of this by using really good sun blocks. Fluouracil, we use this quite frequently in a 0.5 to a 5%. We can include other medications with that to help soothe the skin, to help decrease the redness, to help um, also decrease the flakiness of that. A lot of times we'll add vitamin D and we can also use topical low dose naltrexone in combination with the fluouracil or specifically in a separate product. Usually we're gonna separate those because fluouracil is usually used just a couple times a day or a couple times a week for a very short period of time. Whereas if we're using uh, B12, vitamin D and low dose naltrexone, we're gonna use that for a longer period of time. Actinic keratosis sometimes looks worse after treatment because of the irritation of the medication, um, but it does get better with time. So you can, you can notice how this is raised and red and, and looks really inflamed and it does burn by the way. So whether we are dealing with um, scalp skin, arm skin, facial skin, uh, we can't forget skin on the legs and even the top of the feet, this can happen. Um, and again, you look at these hefty, hefty prices. You are not gonna pay that in a um, compounding pharmacy. 
Sometimes we'll use a little bit of salicylic acid to help slough that skin off and uh, get a little bit deeper in the skin to help with the skin turnover. VersaBase is very soothing. Uh, it's very creamy. It helps the medications to be absorbed in the top several layers, not necessarily super deep, but definitely in the top layers. And then you also want to make sure that you're starting with clean skin before the application. You also want to make sure you've got a good sunblock ap after you apply it, uh, but not directly afterwards. You want to give it a couple of hours to make sure that it is being absorbed appropriately. And we always tell you avoid your mouth, nose, and, and eyes because we don't want to hurt those skins. Those are very soft skins. They're very, um, very uh, thin, and we, we don't want to cause um, additional issues. This is a topical solution of 5-FU along with a little bit of salicylic acid. It's commercially available. Its price isn't too bad, um, but it's not available in the US. It is available in Canada. We can also make you something here. So since it's not available in the US, we can make something very, very similar. And that topical solution is pretty easy to apply. We give it to you in a brown glass bottle with a little applicator. So you could take literally just a drop and drop it right exactly where it needs to go. What I find really interesting about this is diclofenac over the counter is 1%. A diclofenac 3%, if you're using it for inflammation and pain, is not that expensive. But when we're calling it Solarase, it's horrendously expensive. And it also has some other products in it that maybe you don't necessarily want to get into. Sodium hyaluronate is a great emulsifier, but it also helps to plump the skin so that that cell turnover will be a little bit more quicker. Um, and that quickness will decrease the flakiness. So the flakes will literally pop up and move off and you'll see less redness, less irritation. Here's another formula that we've put together in a, a base if we need to push that medication a little bit lower and deeper into the skin. But there was actually a study done in 2010 that went over these medications specifically for actinic keratosis. So when physicians don't know about this, it's because big pharma hasn't picked these up and they don't have a drug rep telling them about them. But that doesn't mean that there isn't science behind it to show that, it's, that it does work. Amiquamod is a medication that we use a lot of times in combination with other products. We can use it by itself. It's a great bleaching agent. Um, it also is, uh, it does have some antiviral properties and it plays well with others. In other words, we can throw it in with uh, other solutions and other creams. Again, nowhere near a thousand dollar price. We want to make sure that when we're dealing with actinic keratosis that we are going after those cells if they are a little bit deeper. So microneedling is literally these little teeny fine needles. They're usually on a roller and they're rolled over the top of the surface so that it can increase the blood flow. And sometimes using a little bit more inflammation will help us to promote the medication deeping, uh, going deeper into the into the skin where the cells, uh, especially the precancer cells, sit. Scarlett, did we see a couple more questions? Yes, we do have a few more. So we've got one about hair loss in women. There's a, a thinning hairline around her face, age 63. Um, and then there's two more. Okay. So with hair loss in women, um, the formulas that we use in women aren't any different than what we use in men. And so really early on, I showed some slides where we use some combination products, uh, primarily minoxidil at a high strength. So not Rogaine that you get over the counter, but a much higher strength. Sometimes we'll throw a little bit of biotin in that. And then depending on um, what the skin looks like and where exactly the hair is lost, we might use something to reduce the inflammation in the bulb of the hair. 
So that might be a tretinoin, which is a vitamin A derivative. It uh, might be even low dose naltrexone. We may even use um, some other medications that work really, really well. We can see hair growth with these solutions, um, whether we're adding latanoprost or not, but we can usually see growth within two months and sometimes even quicker. Okay, so the next question is, what's the process for getting a compounded prescription? Do we just see our doctor and have them call the pharmacy? That is usually one way to do that. Um, I will say a lot of times you have to advocate for yourself because they're very familiar with the commercially available and maybe not necessarily um, familiar with how to write a commercial or a compounded prescription. They literally just need to tell us what medications they want to use and what strengths and then um, how many times a day to use that. We can literally guide them on every step of that process. So if you're needing something for hair loss, we can help them write that prescription. We literally have these formulas available at the pharmacy. We can um, get those to you or get those directly to your physician. Can sunscreens and facial moisturizer be compounded? Usually, um, yes and no. So everything that we compound uh, is by prescription. We do make some amazing moisturizers. We have several of them available over the counter. Uh, they are prescription bases that we use and they are available over the counter. Sometimes when we're making moisturizers, we will add a little bit of B12, maybe some biotin, some sodium hyaluronate, really depends on the area of the skin because the skin on your face is going to be different than the skin on your legs or even the skin on your arms. So we want to make sure that whatever base we're using is going to be appropriate for that type of skin as well. Moisturizers need to contain really good ceramides. Ceramides help to rebuild the skin layer where the skin starts to generate without a lot of other ingredients like alcohols and parabens and things like that that can be irritating. However, like I said, everything does require prescription. When we're dealing with sunscreens and sunblocks, um, what, there are some sunblocks that are available over the counter that are not terribly expensive and it would be too expensive for us to, um, to actually make those. So some of the sunblocks that I really like, uh, there's a garden goddess that is amazing. It's available in a spray form and a cream form, and it actually has titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. So it does stay a little bit whiter on the skin, but it blocks the sun rays rather than incorporating the sun rays into the skin and potentially causing more damage. Some of the sunscreens that start with O's, we are now starting to see some research where they might be harmful in the skin and might actually be potentiating skin cancers. So we have to be careful with that. I will say that keeping your blood level of vitamin D nice and high, so over 70, uh, some people can do that with 2000 international units of vitamin D every day. Some people need much, much higher doses. So get a blood test, see where your vitamin D level's at, because the higher your vitamin D level is, uh, usually you don't burn as much. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use sunblock, so just gonna say. Okay, so we've got another one. Any tips for lichen sclerosis? Oh, well, we haven't gotten there yet, but yes. Um, lichen sclerosis is one of those things that is usually autoimmune in nature. So whether it's on the inside of your mouth or labially or even uh, closer to the rectum, they can all cause a lot of irritation. It's interesting where some dentists, some biological dentists are, are telling me that if we remove mercury amalgams, so those silver fillings in your mouth, then the lichen tends to go away on its own. I find that really interesting. But we do use low-dose naltrexone in a topical form. It can be used in the mouth. We can also use it orally to treat all layers of skin. And the beauty of using that is that it works right there at the cellular level to decrease the inflammation in the pro-inflammatory markers that tend to uh, allow for that, that mucosal skin to raise and kind of ruffle and feel like it's almost like a flap or kind of a ridged raised area. Um, 
lichen isn't necessarily um, life-threatening, but it's irritating as all get out. And it can cause disfigurement where people uh, are concerned about being intimate or they just constantly have this irritation in their mouth. It can also burn. Um, so then if it does burn, we can add maybe a mild steroid or other medications to help decrease that inflammation like ketotifen and a few others, niacinamide. Um, but it depends on where the lesion is as to what kind of medications we're gonna use and certainly what kind of bases we're gonna use. Great questions, you guys. I think that's all for now. If you messaged me a question directly, and I haven't asked it, I have answered you in the chat directly. All right, very good, thank you. We're gonna go over a little bit of uh, high-priced dermatology products. Um, we've been hitting on some of them, but a lot of times medications are prescribed and uh, the office staff, the physician may or may not understand how expensive they are. And it can be a huge sticker shock when you go up to the pharmacy counter and they say, hi, Mrs. Jones, your copay is $750. Um, I'm not sure anybody can afford that. Um, I'm sure Bill Gates and Melinda Gates even have budgets. I mean, that's just, that's a lot. So a lot of times medications can be completely out of the reach of patients and physicians don't necessarily know whether you pick that prescription up or not. But what we do know is that you will continue to have the same issues that you went to the doctor with to begin with, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about um, you know, insurance coverage and some of those discount programs that are out there. A lot of times when a medication is very expensive, the insurance company requires a prior authorization. So that's additional phone calls to the physician's offices that can bog them down. Um, sometimes that decreases patient care, even for urgent needs that are completely irrelevant to prescriptions. What we have seen is a dramatic increase in prices of medications between 2009 and, and currently. Um, and there, that's been not because of the insurance process, but because the manufacturers have taken advantage of some of that. So case in point, I talked about doxycycline a while ago. That is a very traditional oral medication. We use it for upper respiratory infections. We use it for skin infections. We use it for a lot of different things. It's been generic for oh, as long as I can remember. I've been a pharmacist for 34 years. Yeah, brand names have come out in different forms of doxycycline in different strengths, but never has it been $20 a tablet. That's my cost, my cost. So literally it went from pennies and about five, six years ago, maybe, oh, maybe it's a little bit longer than that. It was about $10 a or $2 a tablet. Then it went up to 10 and then it went up to 20. And I'm like, why? Same label, same drug, tablet looks the same. I haven't seen any new research. Not like there's all this other, you know, cost to the drug manufacturers, but the manufacturers have literally taken advantage of that. To me, I don't know how to stop it, but it needs to stop. Topical medications have increased dramatically, sometimes even more so than uh, oral medications, especially when they are very specific in nature. So you see a lot of these commercials out there for psoriasis. I mean, those, those commercials are on every single night. It doesn't matter what show you're watching, they're there, right? But those those biologics are thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, literally like two to four, maybe even $5,000 a month. And not many medications or not many people can afford that kind of medication. But they also pack a pretty deep side effect profile. And they literally go through that, right? Um, and some of those are a little scary when we're dealing with it. That doesn't mean you have to live with the issue. It just means that we need to find something that is going to work for you. Um, we might have to try a couple of different things, but we're certainly not going to hit you with a thousand dollar price tag or even a seven hundred and fifty dollar price tag. Most of these are going to be under a hundred dollars, maybe up to two hundred dollars. Depends on the volume, of course. 
but when we can use medications that we know there's uh, science behind it, we know that they're effective, we know that they work, we know what kind of dosing to use, and we know how often to use those. Some of them pack a lot less um, side effects when we can use them in uh, bases that are a little more specific to uh, that skin type where it can be uh, uh, definitely applied. Whereas we're not using just one type of base to apply anywhere on the body. I will also say that we don't use ointments as much as they are currently prescribed. And the reason is, is because ointments tend to sit on top of the skin. So the first few layers of skin uh, like water more so than they like oils and ointments are made out of oil, but the deeper skin uh, layers tend to be more um, oil loving or lipophilic. But we have creams that actually have both of those phases built in. So if we want the medication to sit on top of the skin, because we know that that's where the skin issue is, that's where the diagnosis is made, then we can use a very specific base. If we need it to go deeper, we can change the base. Same medication, just a different base. That isn't always commercially available, but it is available in a com compounding pharmacy. So even when we see insurances get involved, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be covered or fully covered. And this can decrease not only the um, access of medication to the patient, but it could definitely slow the progress and in the curing of the, medic of the disease. And I think that that's a huge issue. Lately, we've seen a wide variety of discount coupons. And what's really interesting is that most of these discount coupons are available for these overpriced name brand drugs. And really what they are is they work out to be um, on the back end, the insurance company ends up paying the drug manufacturer for those. So they give you a huge discount, but then they charge the, the insurance company and uh, it becomes kind of this very interesting who's paying who and I wonder if there isn't um, some kind of sketchy transactions going on. I've literally seen drug manufacturers get paid more than if they were to uh, you know just uh, use a regular traditional insurance. So there's other ways to go about this. And uh, this is again, one that, you know, a little bit of a cyclovir, a little bit of hydrocortisone, there's no generic, holy cow, but we can add a little bit of lidocaine. And I will say this is cyclovir, hydrocortisone, lidocaine, a 30 gram. So this is a five gram, five gram. Five gram is literally a teaspoon of cream. So they're charging you, actually they're charging me $1,224 for a teaspoon of cream. Didn't that just make your socks fall off? Whereas we usually dispense about 15 grams. So that's half an ounce. And that runs somewhere around 80, 90, maybe hundred bucks. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So a little different, a little different. But when you're dealing with issues that are first of all, unsightly, but number two are really, really painful. Um, and they stick around for sometimes weeks. They have different stages and they, they stick around. We can, we can use things a little bit differently. This is a, again, a, um, an adhesive paste that we can apply so it will actually stick there and stay there. This is a medication that is used um, to help decrease redness and, and the flakiness. Who's got 8,000 bucks? I'd rather take that 8,000 bucks and go to Hawaii. Hawaii's open, let's go. But we can use a wide variety of, of medications to get to the same issues, provide the same level of care, maybe even better level of care because my creams don't have blue and yellow. Um, they don't necessarily have all of these other little funny ingredients in there either. But when we can use natural products, whether we're using um, a little bit of aloe, some tea tree oil, perhaps it's um, got, maybe you have a little bit of a smell to it, but we can effectively treat it. 
this one is this one was one of my favorites when we were digging this up. Clobetasol is one of the oldest steroids out there. The brand name product is um, Olex E. It's a foam, so um, you know it's it's creamy, it's smooth, but it's still really expensive. I don't know why. It's not a new drug. It's just in a new vehicle. This is literally a foam device. It's a solution inside the bottle. You push down on the pump, it, it incorporates air and it makes this foam. So we use a very specific uh, device for that. We can throw a little bit of zinc in there and help with that, um, that dermatology issue even more so than just helping with that steroid. Again, here's another example. Oi, oi. And by the way, when I'm, when I'm showing you this, this is literally the pharmacy cost. So that's what I pay for it. It probably has another price on top of that, which is um, what we would charge the insurance company. And it would probably be uh, one and a half to two times that. So here is one of my favorites. I love fluticasone. It's a really nice steroid. Um, there are a wide variety of steroids that we can use. Fluticasone is, uh, we use it in nasal sprays quite a bit, especially for allergy issues. But when we use naltrexone, we can see a decrease in redness. We can see decrease in itching and we can um, see a decrease in inflammation. So th those skin lesions are gonna come together quicker and they're not gonna itch, it's not gonna flake. And again, you apply a very small amount twice a day. AA means affected area. Um, you would not want to use low dose naltrexone in an oral or topical product if you are using pain medications. Even if you use it topically, it can block the activity of pain medications. Kind of interesting, huh? So we've touched on a little bit of LDN. We're gonna dive into it a little bit. So it's literally an old drug been out since 1964. Well, we use it in really large doses. We can use it for alcohol overuse syndrome, methadone um, addiction, and a wide variety of other addictions. We started really digging into its effects with low, low doses in 1985. Again, not new information. Dr. Bahari was working with a wide variety of AIDS patients. Most of these were um, men back in New York who were also alcoholics. So they did not necessarily um, contract AIDS or HIV through drug use or needle use. This was through sexual activity. And so that area, that, that grouping of individuals were treated differently because a lot of them were also um, alcoholics. Dr. Bahari was using naltrexone, but because most of them were out of work, they were cutting their tablets up to kind of stretch using that medication. And when he literally watched uh, quite a few of these individuals get better instead of getting worse. So back in the late eighties, if you were diagnosed with HIV, that was a death sentence. You were literally gonna be dead in a couple of years. But between the work of Dr. Bahari and Dr. Zagon, they literally found that the use of low dose naltrexone improved the outlook of um, HIV and AIDS diagnosis because of how it modulates the immune system. So anytime that we're dealing with an autoimmune issue, we can see that low dose naltrexone will upregulate natural painkillers, also called endorphins. It will block very specific opiate receptors. It can also block the turnover of certain um, cancer cell growth factories in the cells. And we also know that when we're dealing specifically with dermatology issues, it will block those receptors that, that actually cause itching and irritation. All the while it's modulating the immune system. Pretty cool drug. Because it's working directly at the cellular level, specifically on these cells, and we know the direct mechanism of action with this, and these different toll-like receptors are found in the cell and also outside of the cell, we know that it will uh, uh, very effectively work on a wide variety of disease states. 
So sometimes when you hear about a medication that's going to work for anxiety and depression, also works on cancer, um, helps to decrease situations of autoimmune inflammation, but also works on psoriasis and works on eczema, you're kind of like, what the hell kind of snake oil is this? I mean, we, you know, we've heard those stories before where, my gosh, you put it in the water, it's going to help everybody. What we, and that causes a lot of red flags, especially when a lot of us rely on good science in order to understand and even re recommend medications. We need to know effectively how that's going to work. We need to scientifically prove that this medication is going to work and not cause a lot of harm. So there was a physician who said, look, um, we know that low dose naltrexone is working in a wide variety of issues. I'm really tired of reading all of these articles. I'm gonna to put together a, a summary of that. So he did, and he was working at Dartmouth. So we call it the Dartmouth study. So he did this back in um, 2016, I believe it was. And he compiled uh, 900 articles and case studies and summarized those into disease states, looked at the process by which that study used, looked at um, the dosing that it was used um, in that study, as well as the outcomes. And when he looked at the outcomes of those, he summarized how many people participated, how many people dropped out for whatever reason, and why did they drop out? What other comorbidities or what other disease states did they have? But since 2016, 2017, we've seen even more published papers on the benefits of low dose naltrexone, but we see very few side effects and we also see um, very few drug interactions. So if you would like a copy of this study, I'm more than happy to email that to you. Actually, I should stop right there. Scarlett would be more than happy to email that to you. She is the, uh, the master of that. So when we're dealing with evidence-based medicine, we need to really look at the very specific um, uh, drugs because not all drugs work in all different situations. But we have very effectively used LDN in psoriasis to not only decrease inflammation, but also the cell turnover and the itching. Um, eczema, Haley, Haley disease is a, uh, it, it's a very painful medication. So earlier, somebody asked about pemphigoid. So Haley Haley looks similar to that. It's usually in the armpit area. It can be raised, warm, purple. Uh, it can have pustules. It can have raised plaques. And because it's in the armpit, it's very difficult to wear clothing. Um, we use low-dose naltrexone in alopecia not just alopecia areata, but we can use it even in combination with other medications to help decrease inflammation around the hair shaft. So pruritus is, is itching. We can see it used in, in lichen situations because lichen sometimes is an environmental issue. It can be a gut issue. It can also be an autoimmune, but we use it for a wide variety of other autoimmune issues too. Everything from fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto, Graves disease, and also in addictions. So if you're not asking yourself, how can one drug do all of this? You should be asking yourself because when I first learned about low-dose naltrexone about 20 years ago, I thought there is no way. I mean, come on, really? But the more I got into the science of it, yeah, it really does. When we use it in higher doses, we find that this medication works very, very differently than when we use it in very small doses. And we've even seen studies done in 2007 where it was combined with um, medications to help decrease opiate addiction. Now, unfortunately, that medication never made it to uh, the forefront and, and into the general public. But because of the information that was published in that study, and that was done at Yale, I believe, we can use low-dose naltrexone in actually in its ultra-low-dose microgram dosing, and we use it simultaneously to help individuals get off of using their opiates and uh, pain medications. Oral doses are about 96% absorbed, which makes it very, very effective. It's not always available. It doesn't have to be available just in a capsule. We use this in liquids as well. 
We can also use it in a trochee or a little lozenge that can be dissolved underneath the, um, underneath the, the tongue. We do use it transdermally because we use it for autoimmune, or excuse me, autism and individuals on the spectrum disorder. We use this in young children. Dr. McCandless was um, a, an amazing researcher. Unfortunately, she's uh, no longer with us, but in the information that she presented and, and put together using this medication in very young children as, as young as 10 or 11 months old, she saw dramatic results. Children that were not using um, eye contact, that we they were not using their words, they would flap, they would literally flap. Um, they stopped doing that after a very short period of time. And one of the most poignant um, stories that she told when I, I listened to one of her interviews is that there is uh, something very special about when a parent tells you that their child is three years old and for the very first time said, mommy, I love you. Um, that hits you hard, right? So, uh, you know, I'm a mom, I've got four kids, they're all grown. I've got grandchildren now, which is uh, the best, but I can't imagine not hearing your children's words and not hearing from your child that they love you. Um, that's, that's just amazing. But we do know that uh, LDN works not only topically, but also transdermally. So now Drexone actually blocks toll-like receptor, specifically receptor four. We know that it also blocks toll-like receptor nine, which is some of the newer information that has come out in the last um, two to three years. And it also blocks interleukin um, six and 12. So you probably heard a little bit about interleukin six over the last 15 months or so with the COVID crisis. So it's one of those cytokines that uh, invades the lung tissue. There's a lot of fluid that builds up, a lot of inflammation that builds up. And with that can cause um, a lot of damage in the lungs and sometimes it's long-term. But we do know that LDN will block that dramatically. We know so that we it will have a also... question. Yeah, sorry. No, we have a question please. regarding that. Someone asked, do you have a statement about COVID, specifically immunity response, other than the vaccine? Um, so to clarify, are you asking if there are other medications that can be used to prevent getting COVID or once you've got COVID can help decrease the symptoms? What um, Can I ask a, a little bit more specific? Uh, you can, whoever asked that question, if you'd like to stay anonymous, you can just type it into me and I'll say it, or you can feel free to unmute yourself and just uh, speak out. I'm not shy about these things, by the way. I haven't seen anything, maybe they're typing. So we'll just give it a second. So I'll go over a little bit more information and maybe this will help. So because it LDN actually suppresses these inflammatory markers, we see that it has been very effective in a wide variety of situations. I do know that there were three studies specifically looking at LDN in positive COVID cases. There was one in New York and two in Chicago. Um, because what was interesting is that a wide, gosh, a, early on, a great number of individuals who were taking LDN were not catching COVID. And there was curious as to why. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that, I kind of lost the track of that study, that one little study that was being done in New York. However, um, low-dose naltrexone was being used in the treatment of positive COVID cases to decrease the inflammatory storm, and those individuals got better sooner. 
but that's what, but LDN wasn't the only medication that was being used, right? So there were um, different arms of those studies in the two in Chicago and the one in New York. And some of them were using, um, there was one study they were using ivermectin. There was another study that was using some of the, um, the other uh, commonly used medications. Um, zinc was usually a part of the study. Um, but uh, I haven't seen the full studies published yet. I believe they are coming. Uh, when I spoke with one of the physicians that was working in the same hospital where they were conducting one of the studies in Chicago, she said that they were looking to publish that, that those findings more toward the end of summer, early part of fall. Any more details on that question, Scarlett? Uh, the only other details we got were, do we even need to be concerned about COVID? Do we need to be concerned about COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, COVID is a real thing. It's, it's not a myth. It's not a super flu bug. Um, it's a bug all into itself. It's a virus that we have seen dramatic issues with. It affects people differently because everybody's immune system is at a different stage. So whether you vaccinate or not, I think that this is a good reminder to make sure that you are enhancing or modulating your immune system as best that you can. Because whether we're dealing with COVID or flu or you know whatever virus is floating around, viruses can be detrimental to people's health at a variety of time. You, think you, you know, you might think that you're super healthy, that you eat really well, but that doesn't mean that you, you know, a, a virus can't gobsmack you and, and really lay you out. If you want to avoid most of those types of infections, make sure that your immune system is as healthy as possible. How can you do that? You can do that by avoiding sugar, avoiding simple carbs, eating gluten-free, making sure that your vitamin status is as uh, potent as possible. That doesn't mean you go out and you take a whole bunch of, of medications. It means that you get some micronutrient testing and see where you're at. Make sure that your gut is super healthy. Again, you can test and see where you're at. Making sure that your hormones are modulated and, and optimized. Because when your hormones, uh, especially estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and more specifically cortisol and insulin, if those are optimal, whether they're up where they should be or down where they should be, you will be as healthy as possible. Avoiding stress, that's not easy to do. Getting really good sleep, those are all really important factors to making sure that you have a very strong immune system. Um, and that's the bottom line. So whatever you do, it doesn't really matter what we're faced with. If your immune system isn't uh, in really good shape, you're not gonna be in very good shape. I hope that answers that. If not, keep typing, we're, we're good. Atopic dermatitis is rooted in inflammation as is so many other situations. And anytime that we can decrease the amount of inflammation specifically on the surface level, we can make sure that we are as healthy as possible. The bottom line is skin is the very, um, very largest organ in your entire body. If your gut is not working well, you will see issues land on your skin just because even regular metabolites of eating food and those food breakdowns, whether they are environmental elements or not, will escape the gut, go through the bloodstream and end up in the skin because the skin is, is very, um, uh, very vascular. This is a study. It was again, a placebo controlled double blind it was a small study, but I will tell you, most drugs that are out there were done with really small studies. They weren't done with hundreds of thousands of people. They were done with small numbers. This was done back in 2009. And this was on the efficacy of oral naltrexone on itching and, and uh, atopic eczema. Um, I'm wondering if I have my slide in here. 
So there was a, a woman who was a single mom, uh, office worker, couple of kids at home, and she she had eczema primarily on her hands and she had a lot of uh, skin peeling and it would break and crack and peel. And because she typed on a computer almost all day long, um, that uh, the agility of her fingers were very important and being able to you know, open and, and close her hands, pick up the phone, reach for a pen, change papers. A lot of that was causing um, some issues because when she had eczema on her hands, this would peel and flake and crack and bleed and it would dramatically affect her job. So eventually she had to quit. So she used oral naltrexone and within 60 days it resolved. And she was able to go back to work, which was fabulous because she was a single mom. She needed to be able to support her family. We know that low-dose naltrexone um, is an alternative treatment. It's not necessarily a treatment that we use all by itself, but we can use it by itself. It is a wonderful place to start. Uh, this was 71 patients, that's a lot. Only one with psoriatic arthritis, but you can see here that uh, it actually worked quite well for for indiv individuals. Now, this was a recent study that was done last year. So even though most of us were home and well, I wasn't home, but a lot of people were kind of closed up. That doesn't mean that science stopped. It meant science just kept right on going. Um, this was psor uh, psoriasis vulgaris, which means that it had more pustules and it was uh, larger in plaques in this was a six-year-old woman who had 10% of her body surface area covered in um, psoriasis in these painful raised itchy plaques. It also affected her joints. She used low-dose naltrexone and was able to uh, see complete remission, six months. Most of these people have gone through uh, years and years, if not decades, and many, many physicians to realize that using low-dose naltrexone is even an option. So they've used topicals, they've used orals, some of them have even used biologics, and uh, they're not seeing the resolution that they want, so they keep moving on. They keep asking more and more people. Um, this was a wonderful study that was done last year. Um, Dr. Leonard Weinstock, Dr. Jill Cattell are two individuals who also work specifically in their own private practices, but they are medical professionals that contribute to the LDN Research Trust in using, and this study specifically was looking at mast cell activity. Dr. Weinstock is a gastroenterologist and he uses um, LDN specifically for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but he also noticed that those individuals a lot of time had skin issues. So he then kind of branched out because really a GI specialist is looking at skin on the inside of the body not in a dermatologist looks at skin on the outside of the body. So those two areas do tend to um, overlap. Again, these were a couple of studies, uh, again, very recently that showed dramatic changes and results. This was a study on lichen and how the evidence of, of uh, decreasing the itching and the inflammation specifically on those using uh, low-dose naltrexone were able to tolerate that without adverse side effects. Haley Haley disease, again, um, very, very uh, horrible autoimmune, fairly rare, but again, they were started at a fairly low dose and increased up to 4.5 milligram, um, but not only, not all of them did. Again, only three patients but they did see a significant healing of the, their issues and their irritations and lesions. And um, again, once they stopped the LDN, their symptoms came back. And that's because when you, when you stop the blockade of those inflammatory chemicals, it, you know, you, you, put a stop to it, you basically put up a fence with low dose naltrexone, you remove the fence and they're just gonna run amok again. So that was on um, Haley Haley with the benign um, pemphigus that someone mentioned earlier. 
So we do see low dose naltrexone being used um, continuously and we're seeing more and more studies being done on very significant and um, serious diagnoses. Alopecia areata is one that um, nobody really wants that diagnosis. And sometimes the hair loss is in blotches. We can use LDN in combination with other medications, whether they're topical or oral. But a lot of times we have seen evidence where not only is the hair shaft um, regrowing and it's because of the reduction of inflammation in that bulb, right where the hair grows. How low dose naltrexone is prescribed is we start low and we go slow because one size does not fit all. We don't necessarily jump right in at three and four and a half milligram. We usually start very low, maybe even a 0.5 or a one milligram. We use that daily at bedtime and we slowly increase over very specific intervals, usually seven to 14 days. In some situations, adding a morning dose can be beneficial. The morning dose and the bedtime dose are not necessarily equal. Usually we'll ramp up the bedtime dose to anywhere between three and four and a half milligram before starting the morning dose. And we do this for depression and anxiety, as well as um, a wide variety of pain situations. So those are um, very easily uh, changed with time. Forms um, are available. We have a wide variety of templates available for physicians to use. And there's quite a bit of information at the pharmacy, both in uh, book form as well as paper format. So we have a lot of research materials, but there are two books, uh, the LDN book, volume one and volume two that are have those chapters are written specifically by experts in those fields. Most of those are physicians and researchers. When we're able to find someone's happy dose, it's with the slow titration. And so um, in this titration schedule, if somebody gets up to week three, they're taking three milligrams, whereas, and they might feel really good, but maybe on the next week, they move up to 3.5 milligrams and they're not feeling as great. Then we literally put them back down at the three milligram because more isn't necessarily better. Some people do better with liquids than capsules and that's okay. Um, we, it, liquids are easier to manipulate and maybe even more slowly increase those doses so we can um, uh, fine tune those doses. And we had to do that with several patients where they started with this titration schedule and we had to move them to this titration schedule. So we moved them away from capsules to liquids because one gal's dose, her favorite dose is 3.1 milligram. And you can't do that by opening a capsule and, and splitting it up. Not gonna happen, it doesn't work. So whether they're tablets, um, we don't make tablets currently. Um, we make very small capsules. They're very easy to swallow. Um, we do quality assurance on every single batch. Not all compounders do. When we're dealing with very small doses of one to 4.5 milligram, it's really important to make sure that that quality assurance is being done to ensure that those doses are precise. Um, colorants can be added, although most people, most of us don't use that and 90 day supply is uh, always going to get you a better price. These medications usually range in price from around 60 to $77 for anywhere from um, uh, two to a three month supply. That's pretty affordable. We will work directly with you to help you decide what base and what uh, dosage form is going to work best. I will say that uh, the naltrexone is bitter. So if we're using a liquid, we tend to put a little splash of stevia in there. That is negotiable. It does not have to be in there. And we always add a little bit of flavor. Um, we're no longer using tea berry. Um, tea berry is a very old flavor. Some people really like the nostalgia of that. Unfortunately, it's not currently available. Um, there is another flavor that's really yummy though. It's called uh, mango passion fruit. It's kind of fun. We can use this in a wide variety of dilutions and uh, in also applications. So whether it's topical, gonna sit on top of the skin or transdermal, get deeper into the skin and into the bloodstream will depend on what type of diagnoses that we're trying to treat. So if we're treating somebody with autism, we're gonna use transdermal. If we're using uh, this for 
um, uh, psoriasis or a lichen, we're gonna use a topical format. We don't use very much of this. We're using a half to 1%, so very small amount, and it plays well with others. So we can combine it very easily to reduce redness, um, enhance uh, better um, skin turnover, more effective turnover. We can use anti-infectives, and we can also use it to help stimulate hair growth. So transdermal is usually used for those individuals who are looking to um, send that right into the bloodstream, but yet they could not use an oral um, liquid or capsule. We also combine it with other medications to enhance uh, mood and depression and also brain fog and uh, burnout. We're very careful to make sure that we set up expectations ahead of time so that patients understand that LDN is not a cure-all. When you stop using LDN, your symptoms are probably gonna come back. Most respond within 60 days. However, some feel worse before they feel better. And that's because of how the immune system is actually modulating. So for example, if you have 10 issues, the immune system is gonna work 24 seven equally on those 10 issues. It doesn't pick one or two or five to work on. It's going to work equally. So it's going to take those 10 issues and give each one 10% of its, of its activity. However, as um, certain situations resolve, concentrated efforts will be left on those areas that um, still need some work. So maybe you've reduced your um, diagnoses by 50%. So you've gone from 10 issues, now you're down to five issues. So the immune system is now going to be able to concentrate its efforts on those five different areas, which means all, all areas are going to get 20% of its work. So when the immune system is working harder on a more concentrated area, sometimes other issues arise. And those can be underlying diagnoses that maybe were not um, apparent to begin with. So that's where sometimes people feel worse before they get better. But we, we um, check in with people to make sure that people are doing well, make sure that um, they're not uh, attaching so-called side effects or new things that are coming up directly to the LDN. And we can make sure that LDN is working as effectively as possible. Not everybody gets to the same dose. Some people's happy dose is somewhere in between. So when we follow up with patients, we're able to hear amazing success stories and a few failures here and there. That does happen. We're all a little bit different. And sometimes we're able to change doses to make things um, even more uh, beneficial for that individual. Dosage adjustments usually um, happen uh, maybe as many as nine to 12 times before we're finding the right dose. And that's where the liquids are a little bit easier to manipulate, but sometimes capsules can be uh, dosed appropriately. We answer questions as they come up. We help to alleviate side effects, which there are very, very few of. Maybe um, a vivid dreams, that just tells us that LDN is working. Some people might have a little bit of a headache. Um, they might get a little bit of constipation because of how it blinds to some of the receptors in the gut, but we're able to alleviate that by decreasing dosing. We always communicate back to the prescriber to enhance overall patient outcomes. That's the bottom line, right? We're here to help you make you feel better. We're on your journey with you side by side. We're here to help answer your questions as best we can. Um, and one thing I love about LDN is that it's really low risk, very few side effects, low cost, low drug interactions, um, and it's a very low dose. So it's kind of one of those things that's like, why not try it? So I thank you for your time tonight. Boy, we are an hour 49 into this, uh, almost two hours in. And uh, boy, this is, I appreciate everybody hanging with us and, and uh, staying to the bitter end. This does not have to be the very last time we chat. This is my personal email. You're more than welcome to use that. You can also get a hold of me at the store, although I won't be there tomorrow, but I will be back on Monday. Um, you're also more than welcome to check us out at makerscompounding.com. We've got a great website there as well as the ldnpharmacist.com. I am an international consultant for the LDN Research Trust. And you can find us on a wide variety of social media platforms as well.